new book, And I Darken, which is a gender bent Vlad the Impaler story. Which, if you don't know about Vlad the Impaler, because I know nothing about Vlad the Impaler, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's you don't like, have to know. You learn so much, and it's so interesting, and also really fun. The main character is a girl, obviously, and it's told from two point of views her and her brother, Radu. There was a historical Romanian prince named Vlad the Impaler, super well known for being incredibly brutal even during the Middle Ages. So I thought, what's more relatable to, the, to teens than turning him <laughs> into a girl and writing a book about him? So yeah, it's a gender swap Vlad the Impaler set in the 1400s in the Ottoman Empire. It's about a brother and a sister and a sultan and impalings, all those teen things. So I know nothing about the Ottoman <laughs> Empire. So I've, I've just been reading this his last three days and I'm really enjoying it because I'm learning so much. I've heard of Vlad the Impaler, but I knew nothing about him really. Mm -hmm. Did you learn about him in school or did you like I, stumble across him later? And... I did not learn about him in school. What happened was my first week at college, I met this super hot guy and he had just gotten back from Romania, where he lived in Transylvania, and I will admit, oh my god, until I talked to him, I had no idea Transylvania was a real place. <laughs> I didn't think it was a real place either. I thought it was made up. So, in order to get in good with this hot guy, who I'm now married to, going oh on 14 my god. Years, I started learning more about Romania, and it turned out that Vlad the Impaler was actually known as Vlad Dracul, which sounds familiar because of Dracula, Dracula. Yeah. right? So he was so notorious that they think he was the inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula. So I had read some books about that, and then my husband and I actually went to Romania oh and gosh. visited a lot of the places where he lived, and it was like so dramatic and gorgeous and inspirational that I kind of kept learning about That's it. That's so cool. Before we go on, I want to just ask you a quick question about your name. Is your life been like a series of the mispronunciations of your name yes. because there are not many authors named like Kirsten, Kristen, Christine, and mm -hmm. such. And is that like a pet peeve of yours? Because it's my biggest pet peeve. Yes, of my it drove me nuts when I was younger. Like if somebody consistently mispronounced my name, I hated that. <laughs> like there was no redemption from that. Um, as I come to adulthood, I'm like. Eh. Whatever. I clearly say Christine, mm -hmm. but it's everyone calls me Christina. <laughs> I get Christina, I get Christine, I get Kirsten. One time I got Pearson with a P. What? It's like, that's not even a name, but okay, <laughs> sure, I'll go with it. I got Christian once, like <laughs> the, the male form of my own name. I was like, have you ever met a girl named Christian? It's the worst one. It's like on an attendance form and it clearly says Christine and all through school teachers would be like, Christina? And I'm like, <laughs> it's spelled with an E, you can read, you're my teacher. <laughs> Sure. Oh, I bet. I feel your pain. I yeah. Feel your pain. Yeah, I'm glad. You know what I just noticed also recently? Like, I thought about how there are no book characters with names like Kristen, Christine, and stuff like that. That's true. Probably because nobody would know how to say them. <laughs> yeah. The worst, though, I will tell you as a parent, is when your kids' names start showing up as love interests in YA books. And oh. You're like, can't do it. Can't do it. No, sorry. No, so this is uncomfortable. It's really awkward. <laughs> so, you kind of told us about why you went into the Vlad the Impaler storyline, but how was the research process? when you were actually writing the book. It was so hard. <laughs> I had no idea. I was like, oh, this will be easier because history already plotted it for me. <laughs> no. I've, I've read thousands of pages of research for this mm -hmm. because, you know, Vlad is decently well known. Uh, Radu, the brother, who's also a main character, is like a footnote. I'm saying his name right. Yes, way oh, to go. Oh, God. Yes. Um, and then Mehmed is one of the more famous Ottoman sultans. Mehmed. Mehmed. <laughs> Mehmed. <laughs> and so he's got a ton of scholarly work on him, but his is interesting because it depends on the point of view. If it's somebody who likes the Ottoman Empire, it's really like glowingly positive. He's almost sainted, like not even a real person. And if it's written from somebody who didn't like the Ottoman Empire historically, he's like this vicious, depraved, and which, you know, you gotta, that's part of the research is you mm -hmm. have to filter out. I tried to filter out this end and this end and try and find kind of a middle ground yeah. with all of the characters. So this is going to be a trilogy, right? Yes. Uh, have you mapped out everything and yeah. such? Yeah, I knew the, the hardest thing about writing this book is initially I didn't know if it was going to be two books or three. So I got about three-fourths of the way done with this and I was like, if it's two books, they're each going to be about like 1,500 pages. <laughs> Which I was not willing to do. Unfortunately, my editor didn't want either. Yeah. So once I knew that I was structuring it as three books, I was able to map out really clearly where I was going with everything. So book one is kind of, it's definitely the longest period of time. It takes you actually from their births to spoilers. I really like that because also I wasn't expecting to start at the beginning, which made it so much easier to kind of like these characters yeah. and get yeah. to know them and, and that such. And that was one of my goals because Lada, the main character, is not a nice person. <laughs> I needed the readers to see everything that went into making her who she was because I want, I love exploring that capacity we have 
to relate to and almost root for people who are doing terrible things. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so if you've been on edge about this book because it's like Vlad the Impaler and you think the main <laughs> character is going to be like this horrible, brutal human, it's not like that. <laughs> I'm totally rooting for Lada, and I'm just so excited to see where she goes. She's an anti-hero yes. of sorts, yes, of course. Definitely. And I was wondering, who are your favorite anti-heroes in pop culture right now? Oh, good question. So this is not a teen-appropriate show, but <laughs> it's okay. Peaky Blinders is a oh, show I from BBC. That yet. Oh, it's amazing, and all of the people on it are such genuinely terrible people, but you love them <laughs> so much you don't even care. Killian Murphy is the lead character and I would watch him grocery shop. He's that shop. scary guy. Yes. yes. But he's so beautiful. He's like a <laughs> Siamese cat in human form. I watched him in Red Eye. And oh, that's what I yes. always remember. Yes. Like, he was he so scares the that crap intensity. Out of me. Yes. And I love that. I love those people who can sort of project that intensity to the point where it's it's kind of scary. Um so Peaky Blinders also, obviously, I love, love, love Adelina from Marie oh, Lou's, yeah, Marie the Lou, yeah. series. I was so happy when I found out she was coming out with an anti-hero, and I was like, <laughs> yes, let's go dark. But I also love heroes that are allowed to be such broken people, like Jessica Jones, mm. both the graphic yeah, novel yeah. and the also not teen appropriate. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just not it's hitting okay. my market. Like, these are um, great <laughs> ones, though. Jessica Jones, I love because she's a hero, but she's also a really, really messed up, broken person, and they mm -hmm. let her be that, and I like seeing that. When when I was talking to Marie Lou about, um, <laughs> it's a vicious book. <laughs> about Adelina, and I asked her the same question. She said, Ragnar Lothbrok from Vikings. Have you seen Vikings? No. Oh my oh, god. So it. after that, I watched Vikings, and oh god, he's my favorite now. Oh, okay. He's so beautiful, it. too. <laughs> that never hurts, right? It always yeah. helps you root for somebody. No, yeah. Definitely. I feel like, was it Illusions of Faith that you wrote in like one night? It was seven nights. Oh, seven nights. I remember just being a ridiculously <laughs> short period of time. Yes. So what was a day in the life like writing and I darken? So that was not seven nights. <laughs> that was two years of nights. It was kind of stop and go. I would think okay. I was on the right track, and then I would realize I had to do a ton of research to write whatever came next. So I'd have to put it all on hold and dive back into the research hole. Originally, it was going to be three books from three different points of view. Oh, okay. The first book was going to be Lada, the second book was going to be Rod, and the third book was going to be Meth Men. But my editor, who is very intelligent, was like, you know that's not going to work, right? And I was like, oh, you're right. That's not going to work at all. So now it's dual point of view, so I had to go back from what I had already written to insert Rod and make sure that it was balanced between the two points of view. So yeah, it was it was a very sort of choppy process, which was okay. It was just, mm -hmm. it was very different, a lot more labor intensive as far as the research. But the thing with historical fiction that you don't realize is I'm like, okay, I need to reference ancient Arabic erotic poetry. <laughs> so you spend five hours researching ancient Arabic erotic poetry, which was a thing. They were really good at it. And then it's like two lines in the book and you're Aww. like, oh. <laughs> Six hours went into those two lines. Yeah. Or like, you're writing a scene and you're like, wait a second. Would they have a window that opened? I don't know. Oh, God, and so yeah. you start trying to research, but not many people have written on the windows of the 1400s in Wallachia. And so you're just like, <laughs> I'm just taking a window out of the scene. It. There's no window. There's no windows anywhere. What was your actual writing day like? Because you have kids have and kids, such. Yeah. Like, how does that work for you? Oh gosh, it just doesn't. It doesn't work at all. It's awful. And I have a toddler. So with this, it was a lot of nap time and a lot of like 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. So it was rough. It was rough writing the <laughs> sequel. I finally had to buckle down and like hire someone to come watch him for a couple hours in the mm -hmm. mornings. And I found that I get more done in 90 minutes in the morning than I can in like five hours in the evening because I'm like, I am paying for this time yes. so I'm like not on Twitter count. not that I'm ever on Twitter I'm never on Twitter but <laughs> did you write to music when you were writing this no this is the worst <laughs> so normally I do sometimes I write to white noise I could not find the right thing to get me in the frame of mind for this series mm -hmm. until I heard Lord's song from the Mockingjay soundtrack oh Yellow I love that one I've listened to it 1200 times oh my god because it's the only song I found that works so it's I just have it song. on repeat and I don't even, like, I couldn't even tell you the words. It's almost like hypnosis. Mm -hmm. But when it comes on the radio now, I'm like, no, no, it's not time to write. Turn it off. <laughs> it's going to ruin I it. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I'm super traumatized by that song now. Wow, that's that's really cool. That's what I do when I, like, write anything. I have one song that's on repeat yeah, until it you ruin it. gets you in the right it. mood, yes. Yeah. And I ruined Florence and the Machine. <laughs> so there's a lot of aspiring writers watching on this channel. What is your piece of advice that you'd like to give out? I just feel like it's really important to emphasize that no writing is ever wasted. I remember feeling like when I had written my first book, that that was it. That was the book that was going to get me published, and it was bad. It was really bad. So was my second book and my third book. <laughs> but the thing 
is, I was able to learn more and more from writing each of those and take that into what I did next. And those actually informed books that went later on and that sold. So I feel like it's okay if you're not good enough yet. Like give yourself permission to just write. I ask everyone this now because it's very important. What Hogwarts house are you in? Okay, so I have a complicated answer. Oh, really? Team me, 100% Ravenclaw. Okay. All the way. You So Ravenclaw. I think I'm Slytherin now. Oh my god. Either that or I was always secretly Slytherin, but now that I'm in my 30s, I'm like, Screw it, that's Slytherin. <laughs> I've had no problem with that. But I also know which houses I would have had crushes on. Like, I would have been super intimidated by the Gryffindor boys, but I would have really dug the Slytherin boys. <laughs> <laughs> have you taken the test on Pottermore? I have, and the first time I was Ravenclaw, and then when they redid the system, I didn't have my password anymore. Slytherin? Slytherin. Dang! I'm Ravenclaw. So many writers are Slytherin. I have theories. You have theories? I have theories that writers are either Ravenclaw, Slytherin, or Hufflepuff. Because Hufflepuff is the empathy. Nobody's Gryffindor. <laughs> Like, write our stories behind a screen. You're like, there's right. a separation. You're very right. I don't think any of us are Gryffindor. If they are, they're, if they say they're, they're fine. For Lana and Radu, what houses would you sort them in? Like, I haven't read their full arcs yet, so. Yeah. You know what's funny is I think most people would say Lana is Slytherin, but I think she's actually Gryffindor because it takes a tremendous amount of bravery to say, this is the what the world is giving me, and I reject it. Um, and then Radu, I would say, is Slytherin. Really? Yes, because he is so caring, but he's also so calculating. And he uses those relationships to, like, get things. I had him pegged as, like, a Ravenclaw puff. Well, he's definitely, like, he's so, he's definitely leaning toward Ravenclaw, but I would say he's Slytherin. Interesting. Yeah. And I like that with Lada as a mm -hmm. Gryffindor. Just watching her with Radu, I don't know, I just... I feel for her. <laughs> Those siblings. Which one of you did you enjoy writing from more? That's a tough question because I really liked being able to let out my inner middle finger with Lada. <laughs> yeah. It's really what it was because she just rejects everything that's given to her um, as far as like this is what you're supposed to be in order to be a woman. Which was really kind of freeing. But Radu, I love, he's like my precious so little sweet. kitten. I love him so much oh. and I just want him to be happy. For me, dual point of view works best when they're counterbalances to each other. So I had a similar thing in mind games where Fia and Annie were like opposite ends of the spectrum and an entire book in Fia's point of view would have been unreadable and an entire book in Annie's point of view would have been boring. But if you put them together then they balance each other well and I feel yeah. it's kind of like the same thing with Lada and Radu. Is Definitely. Like and I also like exploring scenes where you see them experiencing the same things but they react to them and they process them so differently. If you had to describe each of them with an emoji, do you use emojis? I have actually on my phone in the notes, I have each main character and their emojis. Oh my god! Yes. What are they? Okay, so Lada is the red angry face and a knife. Okay. Nice. Radu was the really wide eyed face. Oh, oh my god. And a purple the heart. One. Yes, like what is going on? But also a heart because he's so loving. Mm. Mehmed was a crown. You my know, favorite though is their dad. Vlad the first. He's uh -huh. just the poop. Oh, what about you? What's your emoji? Oh, that's a good question. Probably the one I use the most is the the laughing face with the tears. Oh yeah. But like, I always use it in like this is the worst. <laughs> like the most depressing way. Yes. To use yes. It. So have you listened to Hamilton yet? Has that hit you? <laughs> I shouldn't admit this online. You're gonna make me a pariah. I have not. Aww. You know what the worst part is? I was talking to my brother and his husband, and I mentioned just in passing that somebody invited me to go to New York and watch Hamilton, but I couldn't go, and my brother oh my face God. was the angry emoji. <laughs> if he had had a weapon of some sort, I don't think I would be here today. In my defense, I, I literally could not go, like, logistically. Mm -hmm. But I, I haven't, because I've been writing, and so I didn't want to get in another voice. Yeah, so this you is how, out on Hamilton. This is how omnipresent Hamilton is in my online life, I dream about Lin-Manuel Miranda constantly. <laughs> like, he just pops up in my dreams all the time. Do you have plans to listen? Yes. Okay. Yes, when I can actually devote time yeah. to experiencing it, because right now it would be like five minutes in the car, mm -hmm. and I don't, I feel like it, 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 it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I feel like it deserves more than that, so when I can give it the time that it deserves, please don't hate me, internet, <laughs> then I will listen to Hamilton. She'll get to Hamilton. Get to Hamilton. Everyone will eventually get to Hamilton, yes. I feel like. Yes. Just waiting for that to hit. My last question is, what are you working on right now? Is it book two? How it is. Okay. It is book two. I'm just about to get edits for it. It was another long experience to write. But I'm <laughs> I'm but I'm like that I have this time because I'm editing book two while I'm plotting out book three mm -hmm. so that I can make any adjustments that I need to. Like because the worst this happened to me with my first trilogy. I got to book three and I realized there was something I needed in book one oh. that I had taken out. Oh my, you already had? I oh already gosh. had it. I took it out because I'm like, oh, this is kind of superfluous. And then in book three, I was like, thanks, <laughs> thanks for that, past Kirsten. So I'm, I'm 
editing book two while I'm plotting book three. And then I also have a middle grade coming out next year that I'm working oh, cool. on. And I'm kind of playing with adult. Like, I just... Going get, everywhere. I get so bored. I get so bored, yeah. <laughs> So, have you been enjoying book two more than writing book one? Or, like, has it been any easier since you've already done all the research? <laughs> no. <laughs> I had to redo all of it because I had done it all a year before. And so, I felt like, even though I had taken notes, I wanted to reread. So, yeah, and get I ended up having to redo almost all of it. And in book two, the really exciting thing that happens is the fall of Constantinople. Oh. Which, yeah, it was so fun to write. Like, I overthrew a city. Um, that's cool. Yeah, but it was intense. And I felt like because that's so well recorded in history, I had to be really, really faithful. The thing I'm excited about for book three is that's when I totally throw out the historical timeline. Because what happens in book three actually took place over like 25 years. And I don't think okay. people are going to buy 45 <laughs> year old main characters in YA. So I just throw that all out. So book three, I'm excited because it's mine. How old does she get in the book? I'm not going to tell you. Spoilers. <laughs> no. So in book one, I think I take them up to 17 or 18. Okay. And in book two, I just never mention them. <laughs> No, they're probably like I. I think the oldest they're gonna get by the end is like twenty one or twenty two, okay, which is still that's college still, age. That's fine. They're not going to college. That's they're fine. overthrowing I'm empires. Of like thirty five year old no, no, rulers. No, no. <laughs> I think we're going yeah. into adult with the YA. <laughs> I'm just gonna take you the whole way through <laughs> to like seventies. No. Well, I'm so excited to finish the book. Thank you so much for coming Thank you and for having talking me. about it with me. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember to pick up And I Dark in June 28th. June 28th. There's a link in the description if you want to pre-order. I'm Christine. I'm Kirsten. Don't I get our names wrong. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Bye!